Okay, so lots of you are back. <clears throat> How are people feeling? Great, we can see thumbs up. <laughs> I'm going to flick through the screens just to see if there's any more thumbs. How are you doing, guys? Yeah, wonderful. Cups of tea, smiles. <laughs> it's really nice. Okay, so we'll get straight on with things. So once again, this is the Anapana Sati session. It's day four already, I can't believe it. It feels like the second day or something, just starting to settle. Um, but it's actually the fourth session. So again, we'll do about 40 minutes, 45 minutes maybe of the sutta and have a, a little five minute break. And I would imagine we'd have quite a few questions today, Ajahn, because quite a few came to me last night that I didn't get yeah. to. So if we can maybe have a little yeah, maybe just 40 minutes or so. Of okay, that. yes. And uh, have a that. nice long window for the questions. So again, please keep them as brief as you can, just so that we can, you know, cover more questions and um, send them in to Anne-Marie, please. So welcome, <coughs> Ajahn Brambach, who... Excellent. For you, it's the evening now, so... It is indeed. So this is Sunday night, <coughs> Sunday night fever. <laughs> so first of all, uh, for the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta, the, the bit which you can see on the word of the Buddha and the bit which I'm reading out, just so far I was uh, talking about how Mindfulness of Breathing developed and cultivate completes the four focuses of mindfulness, the four Satipatthana, and that uh, little by little how the breath comes up into your attention once mindfulness and kindness is there. And how little by little you can notice the breath and uh, notice the full breath. They call the full body of breathing. It's not the physical body, as I keep on uh, referring to even the teachings of the Buddha. He says that specifically. But it is just so you can see, you can be aware of the breath from the very beginning to the very end. It means the breath fills your mind. And so you don't have too many other experiences to disturb it which means you become focused. And that also is the same what happens when you're doing your walking meditation, you become focused on it. And just walking and everything else tends to disappear. And then the next four stages of experiencing joy and pleasure. And I always try and repeat that because it just shows this meditation when you do it properly, it is full of joy and pleasure. It's a lovely thing to do. It's enjoyable. And that then you just uh, start to, that just calms down by itself. And that is during the, the Vedana um, mindfulness practice, the Satipatthana on experience or Vedana or feeling. And then that happiness gets very strong. And that's when it turns into the nimittas. And that's again, part of the meditation, which a lot of people don't focus on, but it actually it is uh, right there in the sutta. When you learn to experiencing the jitta, which is the nimitta, that's how you experience it. You bring joy to it, you still it, and you liberate it. And that is the practice of the jhanas. If you read the suttas a lot, you'll find that liberating the jitta is always refers to entering the jhana. And the nimittas are explained in more detail in the Upikalesa Sutta. And there you have the experience of the very deep meditations which are wonderful. And again, I don't like to, um, to talk, to talk down to lay people, to talk as I would talk to monks or nuns. These things are possible. So not to go for it, not to try and attain it, but just to allow them to happen. And when they do happen, then at least you know what's going on. And then as a result of those jhanas, when you merge afterwards, the five hindrances, as well as weariness and um, discontent disappear from you. So you have energy after the jhanas and you have this wonderful sense of being content with things. 
because that's where you can learn to start to um, to gain insights. That's where the mind is just so powerful, so peaceful, that you can understand your emotions, as I said this morning. And you can let go of the negative ones and get the positive ones. You get so many insights come up. And they say, how do you do insights? You don't do them. They just come quite naturally. You can't avoid them. Your mind is very, very peaceful, very bright. And you just see these things. And so that's where you learn to understand what this anicca is. The things which were once there are now gone. See them fading away, see them ceasing. And just explore this relinquishing things. What are you going to hold on to? Why do you keep things when they're not really yours? You can make use of them, but <coughs> you don't own them. So you can relinquish them. And one little story that I haven't said yet. It's, uh, I should be practicing this little teaching tomorrow. Unfortunately, I've got some work to do tomorrow. <coughs> Another day on the retreat. I don't mind. But usually on the Mondays, this particular anecdote was that uh, I'd be commonly just teaching in our city centre on the weekends. And Sunday night, tonight, I'd come back from our Nolamara city centre in Perth and then uh, come to the monastery and work for another five days. So it was like holding down two jobs, teaching in the city and teaching in uh, Bodhinyana Monastery. So seven days a week work. And the result of that was that whenever I was in this monastery, Bodhinyana Monastery in Serpentine, people would come and they say, oh, what a beautiful monastery this is. And how fortunate you are to be able to live in a place like this. How peaceful and calm and tranquil it all is. And I would say to them, so what on earth are you talking about? This is not peaceful and tranquil. There's so much stuff to be done. There's so many people visiting. There's so many questions to be asked. There's so many building projects to be fixed up. It's not peaceful. Because if you're the abbot of a monastery, you have many responsibilities there. And then I realized that I was missing out on the peace and the tranquility and the beauty as a monastery which I'd built for so many years. I could not see the beauty if I was the abbot and owned the place. So then I decided, usually every Monday morning, every Monday morning, I would decide not to be the abbot in the morning time. What that meant was if any monk came up to me and asked a question on meditation, I said, sorry, I'm not the abbot this morning, go and ask somebody else. If somebody visited and they say, oh, I need to sort of talk to the, the abbot, where's Ajahn Brahm? I said, I don't know, he's not here today or this morning, or when there was some problem with the plumbing or the, the toilets were blocked. Ajahn Brahm, you've got to come and help fix it. So it's not my problem. I'm only visiting today. I became like a, a visitor, not an owner. And that was a nice little trick because that meant on Monday morning, I could walk in the monastery where I lived, just like you could, with someone visiting, not owning it. And I could enjoy its peace and comfort and beauty, just like any visitor could. It's the same if you go to somebody's house, where they invite you to dinner. Then if you, they invite you to dinner, you don't cook the dinner. They invite you to dinner. You don't wash up afterwards. That's their job. You just enjoy eating the dinner. <laughs> and that's like when you're a visitor, not an owner. And that's one beautiful way of learning just how to find some peace and to let go. When you relinquish this ownership of things. So I don't own my meditation. It's wonderful. You don't own it, you just sit there and just relax to the max. And all those things you strive for, all those things you describe, I describe, they just come to you. You don't chase it. So I think that's a nice little uh, segue into that lovely little metaphor of the donkey <laughs> and the carrot. One of my favorite similes, which I made up. That once there was a donkey and its owner wanted to make it pull the cart 
but the donkey wouldn't move. They were as stubborn as a donkey, as the saying goes. And the, do the owner, well, not a very nice chap, got out a stick and started to hit the donkey. But it doesn't matter how hard you hit a donkey, it still doesn't move. But then, instead of torturing that poor donkey, the owner used psychology. Very simple psychology. Just the same way they make you go to work in the morning, <laughs> make you do all this stuff for the government or for yourself or for your family or whatever. This um, owner tied the stick to the donkey's neck. At the end of the stick, tied a string. At the end of the string, tied a carrot. So the donkey could see the carrot about two foot in front of its mouth. And the donkey seeing the carrot two foot in front of his mouth, he likes carrots. So the donkey moves towards the carrot. As the donkey moves towards the carrot, the carrot moves away from the donkey. And the donkey runs after the carrot. And the carrot is still two foot in front of the, 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 uh, the donkey's mouth because the carrot's on the end of a string tied to the stick, which is tied to the donkey's neck. So it doesn't matter how fast the donkey runs, the carrot is normally two foot in front of its mouth. And that's how the, the people used to make the donkeys pull the cart. Now, have you ever seen that in your life? The people, they put these carrots in front of you. Come on, go to university, pass your exams, work hard, uh, get a nice house, uh, get comfortable, learn how to just retire. So often, so often, they're putting a carrot in front of you. But do you ever reach that carrot? You can see it. And sometimes the carrots of life, the perfect relationship, enough money to live by, a comfortable place to live. Sometimes it's just right in front of you. You can always see it. You can smell it, but you move towards it and it moves away from you, just like the carrots. Have you seen that? Trying to get the perfect monastery. <laughs> Trying to get the perfect friends. Sometimes it's so close. You just move towards it and it moves away from you. But of course, that donkey, that donkey, it managed actually to look through the window one day while someone had a Zoom meditation retreat on the computer and the donkey actually saw that retreat and learned how to catch the carrot. <laughs> Such a simple way, but very profound as well. So that donkey had been running after the carrot for such a long time. And now the donkey stopped, stopped chasing it. It stood perfectly still. But what happened to the carrot? The carrot swung further away from the donkey, further than it had ever been before. Just like when I encourage students, I just let go, relax. Don't try and fight sloth and torpor. And they say, but I go further asleep. Yeah, exactly, that's what happens. The carrot's moving further away from you, but be patient. So, you know, you just let go of fighting sloth and torpor, you become more sleepy, but then the sleepiness starts to disappear. Just like that carrot goes four foot in front of the donkey's head, never been that far away before. But then the carrot stops and starts to swing towards the donkey. Wonderful. Now, all the things which you chase, you're doing nothing, you're standing perfectly still, it starts to come towards you. All these deep peace and bliss, nimittas, jhanas, sort of enlightenment. You just sit standing there. It's perfectly still, and it starts to come towards you. And that Coward is now two foot in front of the donkey's mouth again, but this time coming full speed towards the donkey's mouth. And soon it swings so close to the donkey's mouth. This is part of the story which I added, which was wonderful uh, thing to remember. Just before the carrot meets the donkey's mouth, the carrot, sorry, the donkey has to remember a most important part of Buddhist meditation. Not fear, or excitement, because apparently some of you have had fear and excitement in your meditation, and it just uh, stops the meditation developing. When that carrot comes close enough to the donkey's mouth, the donkey asks always to remember the loving kindness, the compassion. As the donkey looking at that carrot coming close to its mouth, says to that carrot, carrot, the door of my mouth is open to you. Come in. <laughs> Otherwise, he just bounces off the donkey's teeth and goes out again. 
this beautiful kindness to allow things to come into your mind. Not with excitement, not with fear, but just allow them to come in. You find they're wonderful experiences. And that means that's how the donkey catches a carrot. It doesn't chase it. It stops. The carrot swings away and comes back in with kindness right into the donkey's mouth. And if that hasn't been happening to you yet, it will. Sometimes you've been meditating just so much effort and so much diligence day after day, month after month, year after year, and you don't get anywhere. And then you decide to stop. Perfectly still. Carrot goes away and starts coming back. And all these amazing experiences of meditation which you read about, they happen. They actually happen. I never did anything. Not me. Exactly, wasn't you? They happen when you disappear. And you vanish when you stop doing things. And you let things occur rather than making them happen. And that's how you catch a carrot. And that's called non ownership, relinquishing. Not just relinquishing just your external stuff, your possessions and things, but relinquish, relinquishing this idea of ownership and the control which comes with it. You're just a visitor to your body. 60, 70, 80, 90 years, look after it, but you don't own it. So if you've got a bit of a defect on your body, like a bit of food stuck to your teeth, that's ah, not my teeth anyway. I'm just making use of them for a while. <laughs> and then later on, if you get sick, ah, I had a good time with my body, do the best I possibly can. When you relax and don't worry about it, more chance of getting better. When it comes to your meditation, please don't make the mistake of owning your meditation. Because sometimes your meditation will be good, sometimes it will be not so good. And this is the, another simile, which I'm going to put in here. I'm rambling on as usual. I'm supposed to be teaching suttas, but it's a really good simile. The one day there was a migrant who came to England and in his home country, that migrant was actually a doctor, very highly educated. But because of you know, uh, civil unrest, political turmoil in that country, he managed to migrate with his family over to England. And when he got to England, he got a job, but not a job as a doctor because his qualifications weren't recognized in the UK. So he got whatever job he could was as a laborer on a building site. And so he worked really hard the first day on the building site. When he got home, his wife asked him, how did it go? How much did you earn? He said, nothing. I never got paid at all. So he went there the second day and the third day. Same thing happened, still no pay. He started to think these people employ migrants from overseas in the UK. It is really mean. They just exploit you. He tried again on Thursday. And again, he didn't get paid at all. So he told his wife, I don't want to go to work again. They just take advantage of poor migrants in the country of England. I don't want to go to work anymore here. They just take advantage of it. They work really, really hard, but nothing, I don't get anything. And his wife said, look, you've got nothing else to do on Friday. Just go to work and see what happens. So the migrant went to work on Friday. He didn't work hard at all on Friday, but the boss gave him this big pay packet. You know, you know you've been work, casual work. You now on this other payday, you get a big pay packet. And he went home and said, I finally figured out how it works in UK. From now on, I'm only going to go to work on Fridays, <laughs> on payday. <laughs> you see, there's a logic to that. We only want to, to meditate when we get the payday. But all the time you do get a wonderful meditation, you realize You've earned that from all the other meditations where you never got paid. Now you get a big pay packet. Pay packet. <laughs> so you know cause and effect. So little by little you relinquish things and you understand just how this whole process works. You let go, let go, let go, let go, let go, and just be still. And then all these wonderful things come to you. And often when you don't expect them. You didn't realize that Friday was payday. So anyway. <laughs> That was a simile of the payday. And anyway, that's that when you practice relinquishing your ownership. You don't control your meditation, just relax and let it be. 
I'll make another simile. Here we go. It's being happy to be here. Um, <laughs> this was a simile which was actually uh, one of the most important similes in a YouTube talk I gave years ago called The Four Ways of Letting Go, which was the most popular YouTube talk I've given, apparently, over a million downloads. That's a lot, a million. Two million, is it? Two million downloads. That's even more than a million. <laughs> <laughs> And that story there was just describing life in a monastery compared to life in a prison. And there's lots of similarities. Sometimes we live in cells. <laughs> we can't do this, we can't do that. And uh, I've been in a few prisons in England before, you know, visiting and teaching. And prisons in UK are much more comfortable than monasteries. In a prison, you get a nice mattress. I sleep on the floor in my monastery. They wouldn't allow that in prison. Then you have a bed and a nice cushion. In prison, you get three meals a day. I only get one and a half. <laughs> and you get much more choice in the prison of food than you, you get here. And the monks over here have to work hard. They don't work either hard in the prison in England. <laughs> and there's so much extra comfort over in a prison than there is in a monastery. And that's where I actually said that when one of the monks who was visiting a prison in Australia described what a Buddhist monastery is like getting up at four o'clock in the morning. But actually, you know, to be honest, you don't have to get up at four o'clock in the morning at Bodhinyana Monastery here in Perth. It's optional. You can always get up earlier if you want to, but not later. <laughs> but anyway, the prisoners were so aghast at just you know, how monks live. that they said, wow, that's terrible in your monastery. And they actually said this. This was a true story. They told this monk, that's terrible where you live. Why don't you come in here and live with us instead in prison? <laughs> it's physically more comfortable. Actually, have air cons in prisons. We don't hear. Actually, we do in the main hall, but not in huts. Actually, there's two huts which do have air cons now. But anyway, the time they told the story, there's no air cons at all. That's air conditions. And when it gets hot in Australia, it's pretty tough without an air con. But anyway, that when he we told his story, he said, "Well, why didn't you come in in here and stay with us instead in prison?" And he started to think, and I started to think, why do people like to stay in monasteries, even though it's more comfortable in prison? Why have we got a big waiting list of people wanting to get here and live here? It's nothing to do with physical comfort. It's become with the emotional feeling of, I want to be here. I don't want to be anywhere else. And you find that contentment, just wanting to be here, it doesn't really matter just how comfortable it is. As long as you've got the basic comforts of life, that's enough. And you're just happy to be here. When you're happy to be here, don't be anywhere else in the whole world. That is a monastery. You made a monastery for yourself, a place of peace, a retreat center. You've renounced ownership and wanting. And that brings you so much peace. And you can do that any time. Many times in my life, I've been places which haven't been perfect, but they've been good enough. And other times, I remember this one time, it was a wonderful experience for me. I was at a Buddhist group over in Japan, and they put me in, it was better than a five-star hotel, it must have been a six-star hotel. I mean, that was all the comforts were there. There was a jacuzzi in there which I just found out actually that's what it was because I didn't know what a jacuzzi was. That came after I ordained as a monk. It's like a big bath and all these buttons and stuff you could press. And even, you know, it's like in, in uh, Japan in a six-star hotel, just sit on the toilet and you just, it just warms up by itself. And you press something and uh, <laughs> the water cleans your backside. You don't use toilet paper. And of course, you know, being a bit of a rebellious 
playful monk. I pressed all the buttons and just played with it. <laughs> you can get sort of hot water, cool water in between, and I was playing it all over the room. <laughs> Good fun. <laughs> I'd never seen one of those before. And like monks are like little kids who haven't grown up sometimes. And that was me that day. But with all of that luxury there, I looked outside the window and there was a, a bit of a forest outside. And I said, that's what I really want to be. It reminded me of a simple life being in a monastery. And even the six star hotel, I didn't want to be there. I was really honest. Crazy. But nevertheless, you find that the comforts, the pleasures, you can renounce those. And you're happy to be here wherever that happens to be. And that becomes the most relinquished and peaceful, content place. So that's what relinquishment means. You let go of ownership. So you can walk in your house. I encourage people to do this one morning a week, even if it's your own house. That one morning a week, just pretend you don't own it. Don't do any washing up or cleaning or cutting the grass or any chores at all. Just like you're visiting somebody else's house. And that means it's like you don't own it and you can enjoy it just like any other visitor would, relinquishing. Anyway, oh my goodness, I haven't even started out. That, that was just um, summing up what I've said so far in the other <laughs> sessions on Anapanasati Sutta. So, and it said that is how mindfulness of being developed and counter. That is how mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated completes the four focuses of mindfulness, the four satipatthanas. But just by doing the Anapana Sati Sutta, you've done the Satipatthana at the same time. Yay, they're together. So you don't have to do one and then do the other. When you're doing one, you're doing the other at the same time. And this is how Ajahn Chah taught. I remember him many, many times when people asked him, what's the difference between Vipassana and Samatha. And that's where he put his hand up. Now you see the front of my hand. You can't see the back of my hand. Now you can see the back of my hand. You can't see the front of my hand. But even though you can't see the front of my hand, the front of the hand is there. It's just you can't see it. Now you can see the front, but you can't see the back. The back is still, here, still there. He said that the front of the hand is like Vipassana. The back of the hand is like Samatha. You can't distinguish them. You may be thinking you're just doing samatha. Vipassana is right behind. You may think you're doing vipassana, but samatha is right behind. Or you can even, as it says in the suttas, do two at the same time. It's all two at the same time. But anyway, that's uh, <coughs> Anapanasati and mindfulness. Uh, Anapanasati and Satipatthana. They are the same. And I think you may have got the message now that when I teach people meditation, you know, personally, sometimes I start with Anapanasati. And if they can't do Anapanasati, then I teach them breath meditation. If they can't do breath meditation, I teach them Satipatthana. If they can't do Satipatthana, I teach them uh, insight meditation. If they can't do insight meditation, I teach them metta meditation. If they can't do metta meditation, I teach them kindness meditation. If they can't do kindness meditation, I teach them Anapanasati. And by that time, they didn't realize that that's where they started. In other words, it's basically all the same type of meditation. It's taking your mind, your problems, putting them down. Did that work? This is the mind. The only way to get the water in this cup still is to put it down. To become still all by itself. That's called meditation. Anyway, now let's do <laughs> today's episode. That <laughs> part of Sati. The four focuses of mindfulness complete the seven enlightenment factors. How do the four focuses of mindfulness develop and cultivate complete the seven enlightenment factors. So this is like enlightenment, but it's a beautiful way of looking at enlightenment with seven factors, which are all, which will lead to enlightenment, which create enlightenment, if you like, cause enlightenment, and also describe it. So number one, when you are mindful of the body, having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful, on that occasion, steady mindfulness is established in you. 
On whatever occasion steady mindfulness is established in you, on that occasion the mindfulness enlightenment factor is aroused in you. You develop it, and by development it comes to fulfillment in you. So in that little statement we have a great definition of mindfulness, at least the mindfulness of the enlightenment factor from the Buddha. Having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose, and mindfulness. When you are, number two, when you are thus mindful, you explore the Dhamma with wisdom. On whatever occasion, abiding, thus mindful, you explore the Dhamma with wisdom. On that occasion, the exploration of Dhamma enlightenment factor is aroused in you. And you develop it, and by development, it comes to fulfillment in you. That is in the part of the Dhamma Wichaya. Sometimes people call it contemplating the Dhamma. Sometimes people even call it thinking the Dhamma. But I always prefer exploring the Dhamma. Because exploring the Dhamma goes beyond thinking and concepts and sees things which you probably haven't been taught before. As I was saying uh, yesterday, you see deeper into things, but you have to be mindful, powerfully mindful, and then you can understand things much better. The exploration of the Dhamma, not thinking, not contemplating, which is too, too cerebral or not uh, insightful enough. And when you explore the Dhamma with wisdom and embark upon a full inquiry into it, unflagging energy is aroused. On whatever occasion, unflagging energy is aroused in you. Ex so it's aroused as you explore Dhamma with wisdom. On that occasion, the energy enlightenment factor is aroused in you. And you develop it, and by development, it comes to fulfillment in you. Because once you start to um, gain insights and you start to explore the truth of things, it is fascinating. Just as I said, you know, when you do walking meditation, that's just walking. What's interesting with walking meditation? But hopefully, you've really focused on it enough. That when you're doing the walking meditation, just it's so incredibly interesting, fascinating, just how many different sensations occur when you're just moving one foot off the ground or one leg off the ground. And I couldn't believe just how much is happening in there. It became fascinating. It became energizing. And even just watching the breath. Some people say, what? You're just spending six days on Anapanasati just watching your breath. What's there to know about the breath? It goes in, it goes out, that's it. But of course, it's far more fascinating than that. And you get really involved and energized in it. And the next of the enlightenment factors, when you have aroused energy, spiritual joy arises, piety. On whatever occasion spiritual joy arises, on that occasion the joy enlightenment factor is aroused in you. And you develop it, and by development it comes to fulfillment in you. You're developing joy. This is a really blissful, happy path. I don't know how other people develop joy in their life. They go and watch a movie. <laughs> I remember one of our members, I think, you remember the book? No, the book is a um, Thai Chinese, and she told me that uh, when she was a young girl in Bangkok, her mother would go to see the Chinese movies once a week, and she'd you know, go off in a taxi or a bus somewhere to the Chinese movie theatre, and she'd always come back with red eyes, and she cried and cried and cried during the movie, because apparently Chinese movies are like that, usual thing, boy and girl fall in love, and either the emperor or the the Chinese army or something happens and they never ever have a happy ending <laughs> and so she always cries every week she cries at the Chinese movies and book her young daughter said well why do you do that for it's suffering you go there and you cry your eyes out I said oh because I like crying <laughs> it's romantic oh it's very moving but anyway I don't know why people like crying like that anyway that's the spiritual joy when we have in a Buddhist meditation, you're really smiling all the time. That spiritual joy is part of the what happens when you meditate. You become a happy person. Oh, and just the art of being happy. 
why don't people just think happiness is more important than being wealthy or being powerful? Happiness is a much better goal. Anyway, this is what happens in the meditation, become happy, PT arises. When number five, when you experience spiritual joy, you don't think about it, it's there. Your body and mind become tranquil. And when I first read that, wow, that's really deep. From spiritual joy, that's where peace comes from. The tranquility of the body and the mind. You don't get a tranquil body and mind if you're suffering. Because suffering is demanding your attention to fix up some problem. The spiritual joy, oh, this is so cool. So beautiful. Oh. Whenever that joy happens in meditation, all oh, the body just gets put, it disappears. And even the mind becomes peaceful. And this was all those cases when I used to listen to the talks of Ajahn Chah live and you know, when I was in Thailand, some of them were just so incredibly beautiful. You didn't realize that that was tranquilizing your body and mind, the joy of it. Not the content of it, but this is the happiness which it was creating. So the joy is what creates, ah, where has it gone? You experience tranquility of body and of mind. And when, Ooh, whatever occasion the body and mind, oh, become tranquil and you experience joy on that occasion, the tranquility and enlightenment factor is aroused in you. I lost my place in it because I really get off on these teachings and I should focus on where I am rather than how they feel. And the enlightenment factor is aroused in you, develop it and by development, the tranquility enlightenment factor come to fulfillment in you. And uh, this is one of my favorite ones. When your body is tranquil, and you'll feel pleasure in the mind. The mind becomes still. This is the next level of tranquility. And whatever occasion the mind becomes still and joyful, on that occasion the stillness, stillness enlightenment factor is aroused in you. And you develop it, and by development it comes to fulfillment in you. The stillness, samadhi, meditation, jhanas. This is how the jhanas get developed and become fulfilled. From spiritual joy, you get tranquility of body and mind. Tranquility of body and mind feels so beautiful, it's happiness. And when you're tranquil and feel pleasure in that mind, the mind becomes still. You don't make it still. This is the direct result caused by tranquil body and pleasure in the mind. As the Buddha said, Sukhi no chitang samadhi yati. It's a Pali phrase. The only reason I quote it in Pali is because people actually start to believe it now. If I just said that from, uh, from happiness, you get into jhanas, happiness is the cause of jhanas. People say, oh, come on, Ajahn Brahm. That's just, you made that up, didn't you? But when I say it's from the Buddha, Sukhi no chitang samadhi yati, from happiness. The jitta enters jhanas. Ooh. Oh, anyway, uh, so if you ever see a miserable monk or a miserable nun who doesn't smile, you know that they've got no hope of getting deep meditation. <laughs> but if you smile a lot and are happy and joyful, yeah, you're in the ballpark. So when you're when your body is tranquil, you feel pleasure in the mind, the mind becomes still on that. Whatever occasion, the mind becomes still and joyful. On that occasion, the stillness enlightenment factor is aroused in you. The jhanas are aroused. You develop them and by development, they come to fulfillment in you. And lastly, number seven, you observe such a still mind. I have here with equanimity, but I prefer now contentment. The still mind with contentment. Contentment means you don't want anything in the whole world. You're happy. You're fulfilled, you're still. No wanting is left. On whatever occasion you observe with contentment, the still mind, on that occasion the contentment enlightenment factor is aroused in you, and you develop it. And by development it comes to fulfillment in you. 
This is how the four focuses of mindfulness completed by Anapanasati, developed and cultivated, complete the seven enlightenment factors. Here you develop the mindfulness, the summing up. Here you develop the mindfulness enlightenment factor, which is supported by seclusion, physical and mental, fading away in cessation and ripens in relinquishment. I love those little um, additions. Supported by seclusion, physical and mental. So you, know, you spend time alone. Seclusion, physical seclusion. But the most important thing is the mental seclusion. So you don't worry about things. You're secluded from the past and the future. Secluded from thinking. Secluding from the five hindrances. And supported by seclusion, fading away cessation, and ripens in relinquishment. You develop the enlightenment exploration of Dharma enlightenment factor. The energy enlightenment factor, the joy enlightenment factor, the tranquility enlightenment factor, the samadhi or stillness enlightenment factor, and the contentment enlightenment factor. Beautiful. Mindfulness, exploration of Dhamma, energy, joy, tranquility, stillness or samadhi and contentment. Incredible positive qualities of mind. That is how the seven enlightenment factors developed and cultivated complete true knowledge and deliverance, which is called full awakening, enlightenment. So those are seven enlightenment factors. And see how just positive they are, how beautiful they are. And this is how an Anapanasati, fulfilling seven enlightenment factors by the way of Satipatthana. And you know what these enlightenment factors are? Mindful, developing the, the Dhamma, energy, joy, tranquility, samadhi, and contentment. So those are things to look out for. If someone says they're enlightened, are they really content? Can they meditate? Have they got joy and energy? Explore the Dhamma, mindful. Lovely little sutta. And that's how she finishes it. I don't know what I could do tomorrow, but I'll think of something. <laughs> See what happens. Okie dokie. I said 40 minutes, it's 42 minutes, but I started a bit late. But fair enough. So five minutes, I let it go into in the loo time. <clears throat> or having a bit of a walk around to ease your aching bones if you're old like me. And also just have a cup of tea or something. Five minute break. And then we have the Q and A. Very good. Okay. Oh. Shall we mute you, Ajahn? Yeah. Go on, mute me.
Okay, all is well. Cups of tea. Yes. <laughs> Relaxation. No teeth are clean. Well so. done. <laughs> Remember one talk I gave, it just coincidence. The right behind me was a shrine and there was a, a <laughs> thing of flowers and it looked really like I had a, <laughs> a bunch of flowers on top of my head. It was very embarrassing. I remember that. <laughs> it's like a big yellow bunch. <laughs> yeah, bunch, yeah, all over my head. I could put them on as a, an adornment. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a halo, <laughs> a giant halo. Yeah. Anyway, okay, so what questions lots, we got of, today? lots of questions. The, nice, the first one's very nice. I'm going to read out those words. Dear okay. Ajahn Brown, thank you for supporting Anukampa. We love Venerable Chanda. It also gives me an opportunity to support a cause I believe in. I have a yeah. question on equanimity. After yeah. um, my second eight day silent retreat, I felt an unfamiliar feeling of no craving, being completely content and nothing was missing. It lasted for a week. Would I dare yeah. to call it having tasted equanimity? Yes. Give yourself the benefit of the doubt there. It's no craving, no wanting anything, just no wanting to go to the toilet, obviously. Even a, an enlightened being has some wanting. In other words, they you know they want to to do their business in the toilet rather than in, in the living room. So they do have some discriminatory wisdom, but it's not the sort of the ones who <laughs> disturbs their mind. <laughs> okay. So it's like a big gross, that's my nature. Oh, that's okay. I'm sure we're all familiar with that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. From Danilo, sometimes letting go springs from a kind of exhaustion of the will. The subtle suffering connected to wanting reaches a point that in a glimpse of wisdom, letting go is the natural and compassionate answer in a wide and a wide clear sky opens. But still, I don't have the feeling of understanding connected to this. Is this right? It sounds right. Understanding will grow from experience. So little by little, time after time, you can learn how to let go more. And oh, that experience I had with that really terrible toothache, the first few months I was in the forest in Thailand, went to the, the uh, medicine cabinet. There was no medicine in it. It had a cabinet, but no medicine in it. No, <laughs> no um, Panadol or aspirins or anything, no paracetamol. And so you just had to endure the, the uh, toothache. And it got worse and worse and worse as the night went on. And the only thing which worked I tried everything I knew to try and get rid of that toothache. It was driving me crazy, driving me bonkers. And then I said, okay, what did what would Ajahn Chah teach? He said, let go, let it be. And that was a wonderful experience because that you actually did it. You did letting go. And the pain just vanished in this in a moment. You were left with bliss. You really so blissed out in the middle of the night, or twelve o'clock, one o'clock in the morning or something. And just it was a wonderful experience to see just there you understood what letting go was. Of course, you tried it next time, it didn't work. But then a few times you understand what it was. It didn't work the next time because I was letting go to trying to get something. And when you're desperate, sometimes you're letting go just to let go. There's no business deal involved in it. So yeah, little by little, as you have these amazing experiences, you learn what letting go is. There has to be real honest letting go. You can't have 99.999%. I will let go if the toothache goes away. Yeah. It has to be pure. Yeah. Okay, next question. Yes, from Augustina. During the retreat while meditating, I felt an extreme, I feel an extremely strong warmth around the heart. Then without yeah. doing anything, breathing becomes very heavy, lots of air coming in and out. After a while, the breathing alone stops almost completely and I need very, very little air to breathe. Again, after what seems like a long time, breathing comes heavily again. I'm fairly new to meditation and was wondering, is this okay or should I do something? Thank you for all your teachings, time and patience. No, it's okay. It's all it is. It's, it's, you know, this is what happens. Breathing gets very, very light. You don't need to breathe so much because you're not metabolizing. 
everything sort of slows down and starts to stop and everything becomes just so calm. So you're, when your car is in a garage, it doesn't need to, to consume any gas, any petrol. Got to remember which country I'm to, talking in, petrol or gas or diesel or whatever, or electricity. It doesn't actually consume energy when it's stationary. And when your brain is pretty quiet, your heart is still beating, so it still needs some um, some uh, air and some sort of breathing, but not that much. So little by little, you got very, very peaceful, but then somehow something in your brain said, oh no, maybe I need a bit more air. So you're breathing heavily for a little bit just to top up the air supply. And then you start started becoming calm. The most important thing you said there was you did nothing. You just watched it and enjoyed it. And you find your body is incredibly smart. If it really needs air, it will breathe. You can't stop it. If it does need air, just trust it. A lot of time I trust my body. It knows better than I do how to breathe and how much air it needs. So I just let it happen, just like you did. And you had a wonderful time. Well done. That's perfectly fine. That's actually A+. Plus. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, Rob's asking about the uh, Dhamma Vichaya factor of enlightenment. What does it cover? Anything. The investigation. Yeah, it investigates uh, basically anything, but because you're mindful and aware, it can, as I say, it can just, you can see a clump of bamboo and it becomes investigated. It gets so beautiful. But then you find the sort of stuff which leads to enlightenment is you know, things like the anicca, dukkha, anatta, but especially anicca, things which you always took for granted were always there. Now they're gone. Now you really realize what they are. By the simile of the tadpole and the frog. Or sometimes even. Uh, that, uh, you can, as you're meditating, get a very, very powerful mind. That mindfulness it's not just awareness. The Buddha gave us extra little twist to in uh, mindfulness, of being able to remember the past very easily, especially the mindfulness of past existences. And sometimes that comes up. If that comes up, you explore those. That is Dhamma Wichiya. Exploring just you know who you were in the past and just how this process of a mind this uh, stream of consciousness goes from one life to another. Powerful stuff. And sometimes these things just come up into your mind, not chosen, and you have the ability just to stay with them and to go deep into them. And that's the exploration. It's fascinating, exp exploring who you were in the past and exploring, how do you know this? That's why it becomes fascinating, it becomes energizing. So I did many experiments you know, as a scientist at university, but they were quite boring. And well, many of them, some were really fascinating, but these are just really get you going with energy and interest. You're breaking new ground, understanding who you are and, or who you're not and how the mind is and what the mind gets up to. I say exploration of the Dhamma because what stops that is, is this can't be right, this can't be true because it's not what you've been taught. Go past the teachings and feel it, explore it, know it for yourself. Okay. Patricia's asking, what is the difference between the Sutta jhanas and the Visuddhimagga jhanas? Thank you. Nothing. They're the same. Good. There's only jhanas. One of the, sometimes people only read the English suttas. They're not the suttas, they're the translations. And as I often said, I've got the, the book here. I wonder if I can just quickly just get it out and just read it out for you. Because this is in the, <coughs> uh, in the Upakalesa suttas, 128, I believe. Or is it 18? Oh, I always get that one. 128. 128. And in the suttas of the Upakalesa. Uh, where does it go? Uh, 
Oh, this is the last person. Okay. Venerable Sir, as we are abiding, diligent, ardent, and resolute, we perceive both light and a vision of forms. Soon afterwards, the light and a vision of forms disappear. We have not discovered the cause for that. Uh, well, the light and vision of forms, where has it gone here? The cause for that. The word which is in the Pali, and it's only in the footnotes, should penetrate that sign, it says. This is only a footnote, nimitan, you should penetrate. And it's all using like nimitas, the signs. And unfortunately, because Bhikkhu Bodhi just translates it as signs, not nimitas, that people don't think the Buddha ever taught nimitas. But the Buddha did. So the commentaries are actually pretty accurate and truthful to the suttas. There aren't, there aren't sutta jhanas and uh, commentary jhanas. They are precisely the same. But because you don't mention nimittas, people think, ah, oh, there's no such nimittas uh, in the sutta jhanas. But there are, it's in Upakalesa Sutta. But it's unfortunate. I actually asked Venal Bhikkhu Bodhi when he first translated this. I helped with the first translation, believe it or not, of Majjhima Nikaya, Middle Lake Discourses of the Buddha. That's one of the things I asked him. Please, 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 can you put the word nimitta in there? He said, but it's in the footnotes. It's like buying a contract and it says it's in the footnotes that you can't <laughs> get any refunds. So the footnotes is not really good enough. But anyway, the, the nimittas are in the suttas as the obstacles to getting the deep meditations. Mm -hmm. So I know the, the upaklesas are the obstacles which happen with nimittas. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you, Ajahn. Okay. Uh, so Sue is saying that in meditation, she experienced an immense feeling of joy, bliss, calmness, and peace. Sometimes it lasted a long time after the end of the meditation. But during the meditation, the body and senses hadn't really disappeared. For example, I could hear the bell ringing at the end. So I conclude that this can't be an experience of jhana, but what was it that happened? Actually, it can be. I'm just giving you the benefit of the doubt here because the Buddha said that it's a sound is the thing which can penetrate into the jhanas, into the first jhanas. It, you hear it, it takes you out. It's one of the reasons why that if someone is in a jhana, you want to sort of, you know, you've got to clear the hall because someone else wants to use it or something. That's what we usually do. We just we go as close as we can into the ear and speak softly, not sort of shouting at them. Or to get a, a sound of a, a, a monastery bell to actually to get them out of the jhanas. Just the same way that human beings use um, a, an alarm clock sound to get you out of sleep. And it's that alarm clock, that, so that sound, the brain has managed to keep sound as its last line of defense. So you can hear disturbing sound in jhanas, in the first jhana when you're not that deep. If you really are deep in the jhana or the second jhana, you can't hear any sound at all. But it's called like the thorn, which can actually get in to the first jhana and take you out. So but what you're saying, just lots of bliss and joy and happiness, who knows, it could have been. And even if it wasn't, it was close enough. Remember the five senses, the, the, um, the lotus has opened up. And you're inside, but you can still just about see or feel or hear rather the sound sense. It's sort of not really turned off, but it's just dormant for a while ready to sort of come up if necessary. So sometimes the sounds, they can disturb the jhana if it's a weak first jhana. Um, can I clarify there? Because she was saying yeah. that the body, the body and senses had not disappeared. So oh, then, okay. would you call body... that a weak no, no, jhana? Okay. No. no, 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 I wouldn't. So thank you for that. Now, if the body and the senses are still perceivable, it's not a week, it's not a jhana, but it's like a, a deep state of meditation. 
And obviously just, I don't know if you saw any limiters there or what you're experiencing, but it was still a very powerful deep state of meditation. You know that sometimes that people get into such states of meditation, the body hasn't disappeared and you can still sort of feel some senses. And sometimes you can't know what to do next. You're very peaceful, very happy, and you can't see any limiters. And one of the reasons why is because you're not looking for them in the sense that you haven't been taught that they exist. And that once you know they're there, you just almost say to yourself, there's a limiter and you can see it. So that's probably Thanks. the state. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So someone's asking, on retreats, their body and mind relaxes and I feel really good about myself and enjoy the breath. But then this sense of well-being and relaxation gives rise to sexual desire and fantasies which become a hindrance to my meditation. How to deal with this? Because they become a hindrance, you find out those, desi oh, those desires and fantasies um, just destroy just what you've worked so hard to get. But the cause of that is that once that you get a certain degree of peace in meditation and the mind becomes reasonably, reasonably still, but not totally still, you get a powerful mind. And that powerful mind, you can think your sexual fantasies much clearer and much deeper and more sensuous than you can with an ordinary mind. That's why it becomes attractive. It's the same way that sometimes, it happened to me and it happens to many people, that when you get into a deep meditation, not that deep, but you know, just the mind is really getting into it. Sometimes you can see, you can start thinking about Dhamma. You give your most brilliant Dhamma talk to yourself, you know, when you're sort of in a really calm, peaceful state of mind. And you really think this is positive, but it's not. This is what the Buddha called the lingering obstacles to samadhi, to stillness, Dhamma Whitaka, thinking about the Dhamma. You're thinking about it, conceptualizing it, and you have the power to do that. It's like your brain has been energized and clarified. You can think without sort of distractions, but there's much better things to come after that, so don't get into that. And so instead of thinking about the Dhamma, thinking of sexual fantasies, what do you want to do that for? Where's that going to lead you? When I was a young monk, you know, started thinking sexual fantasies, I started to ask myself, where does this lead to? So I put it on what the equivalent of fast forward. And blah, 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 instead of like lingering on it, where's this going to lead? Where's this going to lead? Where's it going to get me to? There was never anywhere where I wanted to end up. So after a while, you realize that that does need some restraint. And again, you're missing a great opportunity to get into some really deep meditation by allowing that temporary, uh, temporary happiness of fulfillment, of gross happiness, of sensory enjoyment through fantasies to obsess the mind rather than getting deeper into peacefulness. Thanks, Ajahn. Okay, Samit is asking, few, Samantha, sorry, is asking a few questions related to each other. So what is the difference between awareness and consciousness? And where is consciousness in the body found? You also mentioned that consciousness disappears in the end. Then what and who is being observed? And when will it return? Okay, let's do one at a time. So what's the difference between awareness and consciousness? Is that the first question? Yeah. Okay. So what is mindfulness and consciousness? There are six different types of consciousness. That's why these days I call it consciousnesses. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and knowing. And they're totally different types of consciousness experience. They have a similar similarity because whatever you see through the sense of sight, then the mind turns on and just knows what you saw. The mind knows what you heard. The mind knows what you smelt, tasted, and touched. It also has its own areas of knowledge. And because that sequence of events, seeing, knowing, seeing, knowing, seeing, knowing, seeing, knowing, hearing, knowing, hearing, knowing, because that happens very fast, it has an idea of continuity of consciousness. But if you look at it very clearly, and you can only really do this when you know what 
mind consciousness truly is. We have this pure mind consciousness, which is the jhanas. When you get to know what that mind consciousness is, you can see this happening. You understand that when I am uh, looking at the screen here, it's not just sight consciousness, it's knowing consciousness comes up after every sight consciousness. So it knows what it saw. When you see that process happening, you see this is a just like a movie film, the old movie films on, uh, uh, not on vinyl, what's it called? Uh, on that plastic, uh, which is just a series of photos, stills, which move so fast for the projector that that gives the illusion of continuity just because it's fast. The reality is it's a totally different types of conscious experience. So mindfulness, awareness, is a very, very strong uh, form of each one of those consciousnesses. So you see very clearly, and you know what you saw with great clarity as well. So that, uh, that's my answer to that question. Then okay. next question. So you mentioned that consciousness disappears in the end. So then who or what is being observed? And when will it return? When will consciousness return? It is that nothing is doing the observation because that, that's consciousness. That's the, the mind consciousness knows. So little by little, it stops. It vanishes slowly. You see all the stages of it's vanishing. So your conscious, your aware, mind awareness, as the mind starts to disappear. It's not a person being aware, it's just this process. So you have awareness and it knows what just happened. It takes the object of the past consciousness, the moment before. So I know my, con my awareness was, oops, sorry, I know my mind consciousness was vanishing. I can see it getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then, when it does disappear, of course, you don't know anything. Consciousness has vanished. When does it reappear again? If it is just a state of cessation, which is at the end of the uh, fourth Arupa state, then it's just the momentum, almost you might call it the karma, <coughs> of letting go will decide when it comes back again. Or the other little trick which meditators use is actually to make a resolution. How will come out after such a time? I don't know how this works, but it does work. And then you emerge within a minute, usually of when you when you decided. And but if it is full enlightenment, of course you never emerge. That's the whole point of full enlightenment: disappearing, gone, gone, gone forever. The flame going out. Ajahn, just yeah. to clarify the last point, you mean that if it's the full enlightenment at the end of at the end of somebody's de um, life, yeah. they don't yeah. re-emerge. But I mean, they can yeah. be fully enlightened in this life and they still come back. That's right. The two different enlightenments: the enlightenment with nothing remaining, and the enlightenment with the candles remaining, with like the life still happening. Just like the Buddha was fully enlightened under the Bodhi tree, but he didn't disappear. He was fully conscious after his enlightenment. But then, after his Parinibbana, a Kusinara, it disappeared forever. No remaining, nothing left. Is that okay. annihilation? Of course it wasn't, because there was nothing there, it was just a process. <coughs> process has stopped. Okay, the next one's connected to this. Uh, yeah. Miriam's asking, could you please explain what gets reborn if there's no self? Is it the stream of consciousness with a sense of self? You can't even say it gets reborn, it just continues. A thing gets reborn, but stream of consciousness continues. So it's a stream of consciousness carries on until it's uh, been there, done that, no more, no more wanting anymore, and it stops. Great, so Dill's asking, can one realize stream entry without experiencing the jhanas? I'll, I'll put that one first. Yeah, okay. Again, there's two types of stream entry. There's actually the entering into the path of stream entry and actually getting the fruit of stream entry. 
One is it's, you know, you're just on the path either because you've got enough understanding, it's gonna happen, or you've got enough faith, you're gonna follow this path, it's gonna happen anyway. So either way, when it's inevitable, the Buddha even says it's like it's already happened. But the real stream winning, the, the attainment of stream winning, so you have seen oneself, those first three fetters have been destroyed that that is only, in my opinion, and many other monks, we argue with other th about other things like bhikkhuni ordination. But we all agree that you need the jhanas to actually to get to be a stream winner. To enter the path, you don't need them, but to actually to get the fruits, you do. Because I can't see any way that you can really understand non-self if you are still a tadpole and you haven't developed the arms and the legs to jump out of the pond. Another four jhanas, but even one of them is enough. Okay. And the second question is that does a vipassana meditator practicing samatha but hasn't yet developed jhana, do they, um, oh, let me try that again. Does a vipassana yogi practicing samatha vipassana, not quite sure, develop samadhi before entering final liberation if they've not yet developed jhana? So I think what they're saying is that, will you have to develop jhana at some point in order to attain stream energy? Well, let's make it a bit more accurate, the terminology. You don't develop jhanas. Mm. Jhanas happen, whether you like it or not, no matter what you're doing. So you may think you're a Vipassana meditator. But I know many people, Vipassana meditators, who they're meditating quietly, and then just the mind starts to slow down and stop. And you get, they experience jhanas. They, they don't even tell their teachers because they're not supposed to. Or they tell them, say, don't do that again. But it happens because it's just cause and effect. It's nothing to do with you. It's just what happens with the mind. It gets so peaceful, so still, that the body disappears and limiters come. And you just get drawn into those limiters and develop the jhanas. So it's going to happen. Whatever type of meditation you think you're doing, we're passing the summer to metta or whatever, if you just let go enough, you don't put forth the will, but you allow the will to start to calm down. You let go of things rather than make things happen. Then you find the jhanas will happen as an automatic result of a process. And do you need that to get uh, full enlightenment? Of course you do. This is the act of letting go. Full enlightenment is big letting go. And the jhanas are stages of letting go. So you can't just let go of everything and not be able to let go of the body to get into a jhana. Thank you, Ajahn. There's a follow-up to a, a previous question, but I think <clears throat> it's important because someone's saying that um, some people yeah. teach jhanas that do not involve nimittas and they're easier to get into. And those teachers call them sutta jhanas. Yes, but... The sutta jhanas include nimittas, one, two, eight. And when anyone says easier to get into, then there's usually you get a bit doubtful. Is that really the jhanas? It's just like people can get, sort of, say, degrees, you know, bachelor degrees. They're very easy to get. You just need to put a $100 bill or something into an envelope, send it to some of these dodgy universities in the United States, and you get a degree back in the post. Very easy to get, but are they really the real thing? So the Sutta Jhanas are very clear that the five senses are gone in those Sutta Jhanas. They're not there. And you're blissed out, really mindful. And that the five hindrances are gone afterwards for a long time. So those are Sutta Jhanas. So you sometimes ask a person, if they had a Jhana, what was it like? And so there's a set of jhanas, commentary jhanas. There's only jhanas. You can't have two different types of jhanas. And easier to get into, the easiest way to get into a jhana is by renouncing. And one of the, I haven't really mentioned this yet, one of the best ways of getting into jhana is renouncing your sense of self. 
but you don't do anything. You don't make it happen. When there's a sense of self in there, it's very difficult. That's why, I, and I've said this before, I'll say it again, because it's on record now, because sometimes people ask me, and say, Ajahn Brahm, you talk about jhanas, you write about them, you describe them. But Ajahn Brahm, be honest, can you attain jhanas? They ask me that question. And as you know, it's the eighth pajiti, you're not supposed to mention any of your abilities. And so fortunately, Many years ago, when I was asked uh, on TV in Sri Lanka, I found this really nice, innovative way of asking it, which doesn't bake the precept and which doesn't cause disappointment in people, and also which makes it much easier to understand what these jhanas are and how you attain them, or how, how they happen, rather. And so, in front of all these mostly monks, meditating monks, in one of the great forest monasteries in Sri Lanka, on camera, when someone asked me, Ajahn Brahm, can you attain jhanas? And I told him, no. No, Ajahn Brahm cannot enter jhanas. And they knew that I was up to something. Ajahn Brahm can't enter jhanas. And I gave the answer, Ajahn Brahm has to disappear first. And then the jhanas happen. Ah, and then they got it. It's not a personal attainment. It's a personal disappearance, vanishing. As long as there's an Ajahn Brahm there, you're blocking the jhanas. It's the stays of you disappearing. You're not doing anything. And the more you disappear and vanish, the easier those jhanas are. Beautiful mindfulness, beautiful bliss, but you don't own it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, someone's saying, all my life I've been living in an imposter syndrome of constantly not feeling good enough. In the last meditation, I was really struggling to stay present and listen to your words. Certain words I'd latch on to and then have anxieties about the illness of someone or about not being good enough at work. How do I bring myself back or stop myself going there in the first place? Okay, it's, if you start getting stillness in meditation, and it starts to work, and you're getting some peace and some freedom. Value that. Make it really so important. You don't want to throw it away. So it's giving more value to the peace and the goodness you have. And after a while, when you get more deep into the meditation, it's actually just cleaning those the emotional blockages. The emotions get so wiser. You think you're not good enough. Who said that? And as you go deeper into the meditation, you've got these beautiful, beautiful insights, such as you know, the two bad bricks in the wall. A very simple insight that when I made my first brick wall, building Bodhinyana Monastery, two bricks were crooked. And those two bricks, in my opinion, spoiled the whole wall. And I wanted to, to uh, knock it down, to blow it up, to start again. It, was, it wasn't until Somebody came past that wall and I said, it's a beautiful wall. And I said, you must be joking. Can't you see the two mistakes, the two imperfections? Well, they said, yeah, I can see the two bad bricks, but I can also see the 998 good bricks. That's the first time I could see those good bricks when someone pointed them out to me. There's something about human beings, and not just the questioner, but many of us, we always tend to focus on our mistakes and our faults. And sometimes our mother or father or teachers at school point out those mistakes and we, we believe what they say, that we're not good enough. How good do you have to be? And most people are more than good enough and they realize that for themselves. They can, they can see the 998 beautiful bricks in themselves. They're not perfect. Ajahn Brahm is not perfect. Ajahn Brahm... <coughs> He's got a little cough from hay fever. <laughs> and sometimes I forget what I said and say the wrong things. But that is to be expected of a human being. But when we actually see our faults and see them in uh, perspective, we find they're not that many. We're a human being, they're more than perfect enough. 
And so also just focus on the, the goodness in you. And after a while, you actually say, oh, actually, it's amazing. Or maybe I am a good person. Whoever comes on a retreat, straight away, you're, you know, you're part of the A-list. <laughs> so whoever asks that question, they're part of the A-list. The Anukampa Pikuni Project meditators list. <laughs> the A-list. <laughs> Great. There's lots more questions. Um, we've got five minutes. So oh, yeah, more than that. Let's, let's see how far we can go. Okie dokie. I'll try to be quick. Okay. Christoph has a question about Anapana. Oh, sorry. The Satipatthana Sutta 4.7. Oh, yeah. I think he means the Anapana Sati Sutta. Yeah. Learning yeah. to calm the breath. Yeah. I see that the word in Pali that is used for body of the breath is Kaya Sankaram. Having the word yeah. Sankara, does this refer to calming the volition of breathing, hence stopping controlling breathing? No, Sankara has two meanings, either the thing which actually does stuff, that's the will, or it's actually the result of the will, what the will actually produces. So this is actually what's produced, it's calming the breath. Okay. Um, Piotr is asking, can one get into deep meditation after a stronger cup of coffee, or does the increased heart rate beat and faster breathing caused by caffeine make it impossible to become still enough. What are monastics experiences with that? It really depends. If you're Polish and are used to drinking lots of coffee, then I don't <laughs> think it really matters very much at all. Just like the English, you no, know, we're just a part of our blood is tea. You drink tea first thing in the morning. When I grew up, there's always a pot of tea somewhere to be drunk. So just part of your blood was, was caffeine. <laughs> so it didn't make any difference at all. We used to have a cup of tea and then go to sleep. So it really depends on just your response to caffeine. If you're really, 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 really tired, then fine, take some caffeine. But if you take too much, of course, then that will just make the mind very, very powerful. And if you can't handle that power, then of course you get very restless. But if you know that uh, you can handle power, or you can just use the caffeine just to balance the energies so that you just have energy but not sort of restlessness. And I don't think that's a problem. So someone's saying they hardly dream, but they've had a very vivid dream um, on this retreat and then woke up with lots of feelings. Does meditation affect how we dream? In a sense that it just uh, empowers the mind. Your mind becomes stronger or either your brain becomes stronger. So yeah, you can have stronger dreams, more clear dreams, even lucid dreams. But anyway, okay. as long as it's a good dream, if it's like a, uh, a yucky dream and a negative dream, then just add some more loving kindness to your meditation, especially before you go to sleep. Yeah, good. Okay, someone's asking, why do you think you had an easier time getting into some deep meditation as opposed to some of the other monks with Ajahn Chah? What is your secret? Why did you get it and others who've practiced for 40 years still haven't, even while having the same teacher? Well, sometimes I don't really know uh, <laughs> that, but um, I do know that even those first years as a monk, I volunteered to serve and help in so many different areas. For example, I was the one who actually did all the visas for the monks. I learned Thai, learned how to write Thai, would get all their passports and go to this monk and that monk to get this side and that sign, and then go to Bangkok and get it all filled out. And I was sort of doing this as I thought, this is a way to serve my friends. And then you know, when they come back to, to check their visas and check their passports, and I, you know, we chat. I said, how's your meditation? And they've been in this in incredible, beautiful places, solitude, well-supported. And my meditation was far deeper than theirs was. And that really shocked me at first. How come they've had more support, physical support for their meditation practice? I mean, I was getting deeper meditation. And I realized there's a balance which you have to make in your, your meditation practice. It's just for you, you're just in solitude. There's too much ego. It's no, I'm not my solitude. I'm going to make it perfect. And you chase other people away. That is too much self happening there. But if you do service, you're letting go of yourself. You know that, Venerable Chandra, because you do so much service. It's hard work. But, you know, you're letting go of your sense of self, what I want, what I need. 
but don't do that too much. Get the right balance. And I managed, I'm not sure how I managed to do that, to get the right balance, enough solitude, but also enough um, service. And also, I just, I did have a happy mind. You've got to admit that. So the happiness, the joy, even telling jokes, <laughs> some of that actually helps. It's not an indulgence that I tell jokes. I do that on purpose. To actually to make people light and bring a bit of happiness up in their, their minds. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so Bork is asking, are the hindrances related to a doer? And if yes, how? Yeah, of course. It's wanting. This actually comes from a doer. That's what a doer does. It wants things. It wants to get rid of things. And if you don't want anything, if you don't want to get rid of things, the doer actually tends to disappear and vanish. That's its whole purpose of life. That's, and sometimes if you don't really need anything, you do it anyway, just because to assert that you actually exist. And so once you do things, sometimes you can't get what you want. That's called ill will. And when you try even harder, and that causes tiredness, the sloth and torpor. Or sometimes it's just, no, I'm not going to stand the sloth and torpor, and you work even harder, and that causes you restlessness. And sometimes just to be still, just to be at peace. In our world, especially in our Western world, that is not respected at all. People think you're lazy rather than you are wise. So it was, this was the, uh, like the, Prot no, the, what's it called? Not the Protestants, the Calvinistic Protestantism always to work really, 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 really hard and don't have any rest. And somebody described the Protestant tradition of Calvinism as the fear that somewhere, someone is happy. <laughs> In other words, you weren't supposed to be happy. Work really hard. Okay, another question. Okay, Sorry. yeah, there's two yeah. or three more that look quite important. Uh, this is about somebody's sleepiness. So they said that they've tried to program themselves to get out of bed, but they can't. Um, the thought of snoozing is irresistible. Please advise. Please advise. How oh, can you get an, an electronic bed, automatic bed, which once you put <laughs> the time, it just boom, it flips you up in the morning. <laughs> oh, you can take a snooze, but then just how much snoozing do you need? And sometimes we say to ourselves, oh, well, yeah, you can do, if you're just indulging too much sleep, when you get up, you, you actually, you're dull. Too much sleep makes you dull. Too little sleep makes you dull. So you find that beautiful middle where you slept enough, but not too much. And that means you get up and you're alert, you're alive. Sometimes people sleep too much because of um, depression. But life isn't interesting, so they don't want to get up. But if you're having some good meditation, the, med the life becomes just so beautiful, so wonderful. And you just don't want to miss the dawn. So you just get up just to see the beautiful sunrise in the east. So when you are not depressed, be interested. Then you can have get up early and have much more fun in life. Okay. Um, someone's asking, how can we sustain gentleness and softness outside meditation in daily life where it can be stressful and busy? Will it happen naturally with constant practice? Of course it will happen naturally, but how you can build that up is in the middle of the day to take half an hour out to do some meditation. And what happens is you're not working when you're meditating. You're just relaxing, letting go, making peace. And then after the half an hour meditation, your mind is empowered again. It's energized your batteries, which means in the afternoon, you do three hours work in two hours of good quality. You know what it's like when you're tired. It means that you can't find the right words. You can't put sentence, sorry, sentences together or paragraphs. Your productivity goes down. And that's uh, something which I taught at computer conferences. And apparently it's now in, taught in Harvard Business School. 
It's called an investment of time. It just looks at the productivity and just the quality and the amount of work you do in the afternoon after you've taken a half an hour rest. And not only just the productivity, the amount of time, it means that you rested. You don't get so cranky when you go home and meet your family. Good. We can probably talk more about daily life practice towards the end of the retreat as okay. well. Um, but Fabrizio has a question about the uh, disappearance of himself. Having had a, an experience of the disappearance of the me, it easily happens that he starts to disappear again and that becomes the destination of meditation, enough to hinder the meditation. What should he do to overcome it? Should he try to remove the importance to that? is to remove importance, the key, and a skillful means. It sort of can be. But what's wrong with Fabrizio disappearing? It's usually a nice, a nice experience when you disappear. So I mean, a personal experience. So after a while, don't have any goal in your meditation. I've got to disappear. Just be in this moment, be kind, be gentle. And the disappearance is going to happen anyway. And then you come back again. When you disappeared for a while, you're a far better person, more relaxed, more energized after you return. So the reason it's an obstacle in the meditation is again because you're projecting into the future, wanting something, intending something, having a goal. Instead, just have this wonderful idea of just being happy to be here. Whether I exist or not, I'm just happy to be in this moment. Keep it simple, happy to be here, and then you find that things disappear by themselves. You don't control anything, you don't do it. You just let it happen. And it's perfectly safe. Okay, there's a similar question here. Um, Bogdan's saying he was once in a very, very deep meditation and had wanted to know the nature of his mind, but ended up in a truly bizarre place that he later realized, that I had later realized it was what I had looked for, but while he was in it, part of himself was startled and said, no, this can't be it. But this thought was not controlled or wanted. So I understand you need to let go, but at that point, not much of me was left and there was no way for me to let go. So how do you let go if you don't exist? <laughs> okay. If you can get worried about things, then you're still existing. <laughs> so in other words, you weren't deep enough there. You know, if you could actually think and assess and judge, you're just already just uh, too much existing. So just before you get into those, those states, you haven't gone far enough yet. Just do it a little bit more according to the usual way of getting into the breath the delight in the mind, you know, the, the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth stage of Anapanasati, and then nimittas and joy. And they get those nimittas to be very powerful, so you get into the, the jhanas. And then those jhanas, you can't think, you can't assess like that. You only assess when you come out afterwards. So inside the jhanas, the mind can't move which means that all the information you get from those states, you get afterwards when you emerge, not while you're there. And they're always, always essentially incredibly pleasant. So you haven't gone deep enough yet. You haven't disappeared enough. There's still enough of you left to complain. <laughs> okay, can we do uh, one more? How are you yeah, going? one more. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. getting close to time this old monk should go back into his cave. Okay. So Inga's saying that not all teachers teach nimittas. Do you need to experience them in order to grow? Why not? They're fun. Well, you need to, you don't need to. It's a sense of why not? So if you need to grow, if you have some goals, aspirations, again, it's the goals of the problem. We have these goals, where we want to be, how we want to be. And behind that is this word, we. Over in our retreat center, there's a cartoon. I think it's still on there. And there's 
a meditator who's uh, in noble silence, so he can't actually speak these words. He's got a sign. He goes to the, the meditation, none. <laughs> and the sign says, I want happiness. And the nun, and he's really miserable, really angry. I want happiness. And the nun takes the sign. First problem, first word, I. She rubs that out, crosses that out. So the sign then says, want happiness. So she scrubs that out. And the only thing left on the sign is happiness. And now the man is happy. I want happiness. The problem is those first two words. You scrub those out. I want. And that's the only thing left. Happiness. I want jhana. Scrub out the I. Scrub out the wants. What's left? Jhana. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn. That's wonderful. <laughs> and I think okay. we should we should let you go so that you can let go. Let and go. Get to sleep. Where did you get that idea from? <laughs> let go. <laughs> I thank you for relinquishing me. <laughs> Only okay, temporarily. I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Wonderful. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody.